you for this evening, Lord, and Lord, we just thank you for the gift of worship that you've given us, Lord, of song, and just be able to praise your name in that way. <clears throat> Lord, I just ask now that you'd shine a light on your word, Lord, that you would just capture our hearts with what you would have us to hear, and that your spirit would orchestrate all things to me. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we pick up in chapter 18 tonight. If you're here last week, kind of saw, we kind of jumped through some pretty wide swaths of scripture because, as I said last week, this is kind of a chronicling of these different areas within the promised land that were being given to the tribes. And I'll state again tonight that there's nothing in God's word that's not important. So just that we would move past some of it doesn't mean it doesn't have a significance. It's just, I know, as a as far as teaching, there's not a good way to bring you through all the names of all of those cities and have it really do much for us. Because um, it is just that. It's a chronicling of, of the places that he, <clears throat> that he placed each of these tribes. So we'll kind of jump forward um, the same way we did through the next couple chapters, picking up where we can make application. Let's just jump in right at the beginning of verse, or chapter 18, verse 1. It says, Now the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of meeting there, and the land was subdued before them. But there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. Then Joshua said to the children of Israel, How long will you neglect to go and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? Pick out from among you three men for each tribe, and I will send them. They shall rise and go through the land, survey it according to their inheritance, and come back to me. And they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall remain in their territory on the south, and the house of Joseph shall remain in their territory on the north. You shall therefore survey the land in seven parts and bring the survey here to me, that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. But the Levites have no part among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad, Reuben, the half-tribe of Manasseh, have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan on the east, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave them. Then the men arose to go away, and Joshua charged those who went to survey the land, saying, Go walk through the land, survey it, and come back to me, that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went, passed through the land, and wrote the survey in a book in seven parts by cities, and they came to Joshua at the camp in Shiloh. Then Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua divided the land to the children of Israel according to their divisions. So one of the things that we see is that up until now, their home base, if you will, their, their headquarters was Gil Gilgal. And we talked about Gilgal, that every, after every campaign militarily, they came back to Gilgal. Now it's shifted. It's shifted to a different place called Shiloh. And you can see the semi-permanence of this new location because they actually re-erect the tabernacle there. And they bring the Ark of the Covenant in there. And that is where their home camp will remain, really, until someday when Jerusalem becomes their home city. But here there's these... <laughs> These groups, I, I find it interesting that they're not yet moved into their land, that there's seven tribes that had not received their inheritance. And Joshua seems to say, why haven't you taken what's yours? Which brings a question to mind that I don't have the clear answer to. We see them go survey the land, come back and lots are cast. And yet there seems to be almost an inference here that they sort of know that there's, their land is out there and they should have taken it by now. Um, so why the methodology that Joshua comes up with them to establish themselves in those places. Personally, and this is just conjecture on my part, I think he just wanted them to go see it so they would have that impression and they'd be, okay, it's time to move. Go, you, know, go, you, know, you, don't, you don't usually buy a house without going and looking at it. So it's like, okay, go survey the land, write down what you saw, and then come back and we'll go before the Lord to cast lots and put you where you need to be. Sort of on their behalf, I'd like to make another point, which again, conjecture on my part, but for 40 years, they've wandered the wilderness. 
they really haven't had a home address in a sense and so maybe in their case maybe this was a nervousness to actually establish themselves you know you know it was it was time to to move out on their own in a sense and have their own place um so they did the survey they brought back the information they cast lots and the only other mention besides these seven is again we see that the levites are talked about that they don't have a region that they're given what we find out and we'll see here in a moment that they're given cities quite a few cities but they're spread out amongst all of the tribes and that makes sense because they're the priestly tribe they 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 serve before the lord god but they serve the people in doing that so it would make sense that they'd be mixed amongst the other tribes then verse 11 and going forward to the end of the chapter we see all of the details about the land that was given to Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. We'll, 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 we'll skip the reading of that. We come into chapter 19, and we then see the division of all the places that became the inheritance of the tribe of Judah. And Judah stands out because we know, that we should know, that it's from the tribe of Judah that the Messiah would come that that scepter, that, tr that lion of Judah would rise up out of that particular tribe. And it's also interesting, and I don't have an explanation for it, but there in verse 1, at, at the end of verse 1, it says, and their inheritance was within the inheritance of the children. Oh, excuse me. It says the second lot came out for Simeon. Okay, I actually misstated. This is actually the division for Simeon where they go but their land ends up in the land of Judah, is what I meant to say. I got myself a little twisted there. But it's actually one region within another, and I have no explanation for why that was done, but it was all under God's instruction, so it must have made sense. Picking up in verse 10 through verse 16, we see the, the division that went to Zebulun. Then verses 17 through 23, we see the land that went to the tribe of Issachar. Verses 24 through 31, we have the land that went to the tribe of Asher. 32 through 39, the land that went to Naphtali. And then 40 through 48, we see the land of Dan. We come to verse 49, and we see admirably a bit of humility on the part of Joshua. Because now that everyone has got the land, they've gotten their inheritance, then Joshua takes care of himself. And so we just see the humility of a, of a leader to wait till the end to take what is now his. Let's read that, verse 49. When they had made an end of dividing the land as an inheritance according to their borders, the children of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked for, Timnath Sarah, in the mountains of Ephraim, and he built the city and dwelt in it. These were the inheritances which the Eleazar, the priest, Joshua, the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divided as inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So they made an end of dividing the country. And then in chapter 20, it's a short chapter, but it's a big topic in the sense that we saw God ordain there being the setup of cities of refuge we saw that in early earlier parts in, in the in the beginning of the old testament when god was giving them the laws and the statutes that he established these cities of refuge and, and it's very kind of outside our own thinking that these kind of things would exist but a city of refuge was simply this that a person you'll see called a manslayer a manslayer being someone who has killed another but done it by accident. There was no evil intent. It was not murder. We would call that manslaughter today. But the manslayer, someone that killed somebody, and he established these cities of refuge that those that were manslayers would have a chance to find refuge somewhere while their case was heard. And they were protected because the other part of the law is that the, from the family of the person killed, someone would be chosen as an avenger. And the avenger would be sent out to find the one that killed someone in their family, sounds like a good gangster movie, and, and to, to slay that one. And so the, the picture we have is the avenger doesn't know why this happened, or maybe they weren't, they, they weren't even to consider that, they were just to go after the person that did the deed. 
So these cities of refuge are set up so a person who is a manslayer and not a murderer could find safety there. <clears throat> I wonder about this. And if this is the third time I've used the word conjecture. Um, but I wonder about this and I think about how the Lord spoke of one, of, of the evil of murder, how he speaks of the life that's in the blood. Because he tells us the life is in the blood, and if God is the one who gave life, then the blood must be very dear to him. And we even see at the very beginning with Adam and Eve's first offspring, Cain and Abel. The Cain rose up, and he slew Abel, and when God came to speak, what does he say? He said, I heard your brother's blood crying out from the ground. Personally, I don't think that is, that is a metaphor. I think that's a reality for God. And so I think one of the reasons that he would have set this up was that there would be no more blood shed that needed not be shed. He, he sets out rules for murder. There, there's rules for murder. For a murderer, there would be the life taken to, as a, as, to make it even that a life was taken. But this is not murder. And so as much as he was willing to set that forth that blood would be let for blood being let, if the blood was let because it was an accident, I don't think God wanted to see any more blood have to go forward than needed to. So I think that's why this was so important. Take a look at this chapter. The Lord also spoke to Joshua saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint for yourselves cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses that the slayer who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. Verse 4, And when he flees to one of those cities and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city as one of them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. Now we see this image a lot with cities in the ancient times that the men of the city, the elders in this case, sat in the gate of the city. And that was literal because it was in the gate of the city where they had actual, what we think maybe as, as governmental offices. And they would have been, it would have been where things of the legal matters would have been brought. They would have been brought to the gates of the city to speak to the elders, that they may have governance, that may speak wisdom over a situation. So when this one comes in who's seeking refuge would have to give an account of why they're there and what they need. And, and I guess it would be a matter of the, of the uh, elders to agree to let that person in. It would seem, and from the history that I've read, that they would have been given some simple place to live. And they probably, if they didn't have any skills of their own, being taught skills so that they could be a productive part of the city that was there. Verse 5, Then if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unintentionally, but did not hate him beforehand. But he shall dwell in the city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, and until the death of one who is the high priest in those days. Then the slayer may return and come to his own city and his own house to the city from which he fled. So there was a time period. This person, who, this manslayer who sought refuge in the city would come into the city, and at some point I guess their case would be heard completely. I don't know what form that would take, how they would have evidence if they sent out investigators, had their own CSI, I'm not sure how any of that worked. But there was also a time limit in the sense that that person, whether I guess that trial had come and gone or not, could not leave that city of refuge until the current high priest dies off. So that was, that was their time limit that they had to stay. And then they could return to their home city. Verse 7 so they appointed Kadesh in Galilee in the mountains of Naphtali, Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim, Kirjoth Arba, which is Hebron in the mountains of Judah. And on the other side of the Jordan by Jericho eastward, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness on the plain from the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth in Gilead from the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan from the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel and for the stranger who dwelt among them, that whoever killed a person accidentally might flee there and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Now it would be easy just to run from this short chapter in this topic. 
But it's interesting. First of all, let's, let's just get a bit, a bit, one bigger picture of this. There's six cities of refuge that have been established. There's three on the west side of the Jordan. There's three on the east side of the Jordan. And remember, we showed that map, was that last week or the week before? I showed the map of the, what, of the entirety of the lands that were being given, that were the promised land to the Israelites. Now, they didn't inhabit all of that land. They only inhabited a smaller part of, of that entire land. So when I give you this next fact, that will help make some sense of it. They set these cities up spread out such that at any given point, you were never more than about 30 miles from getting to so they weren't, you know, just all in one place. And they weren't at such a great distance, although in our modern times, the thinking about walking 30 miles might seem extreme, um, especially if you're in a hurry and you're being pursued. Um, but that, that's the way it was set up. And reading some of the history about these refuges outside, outside of our biblical history, it's amazing how much importance they put upon the ability of the one seeking refuge to make sure they made it there. They would make sure that there were roads that were very well maintained leading to every one of these cities. They were broad in the way that most of the roads were some 48 feet side to side. There was never along that road any river or waterway that wasn't bridged. And so they did everything to make sure a person could make it into that city of refuge. And from that, I just see this beautiful picture of our Lord. Because we're told our Lord is our high tower. He is our refuge. We run into him and we are safe. And the road to our Savior, to our refuge, is open to us. And the Lord maintains that so that we can get to him. He doesn't block us when we want to come to him. We want to run into him and be safe. And then you think about the characteristics that the Lord would have in wanting us to seek him as our refuge. And that takes us even into this a little bit deeper because then the picture gets even richer when you consider that. Because listen to the cities and what their names mean. All the cities west of the Jordan. Kadesh means holiness. Shechem means strength. Kijath Arban, which is Hebron, means fellowship so we can see the holiness of our lord the strength of our lord and the fellowship that we have with our lord and that he invites us into that then there were the three cities on the east side of the jordan ramoth gilead which meant uplifting and then golan which means happiness and then bezer which means safety and so we have this beautiful picture in this chapter of the lord you know opening himself as our refuge as a place we run into and that we're safe always and that those roads to him are always broad maintained and, and I say broad when I don't want to skip over another scripture which says the way is narrow but, but I think that's a, a different concept in our heads um, but I just think it's a beautiful picture of that of that of him being our refuge then we jump into chapter 21 and we get into the city of the Levites we'll just read a few of the verses then the heads of the fathers Houses of the Levites came near to Eleazar the priest, to Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers' houses on the tribes of the children of Israel. And they spoke to them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, saying, The Lord commanded through Moses to give us cities to dwell in with their common lands for our livestock. So the children of Israel gave to the Levites from the inheritance at the commandment of the Lord these cities and their common lands. And so again, the Levites not given any particular region. They were given cities. As a matter of fact, they're, they're, in total, they received some 48 cities spread out amongst the different areas. <clears throat> and then all that is listed, chronicled through the rest of that chapter. And then we come down to the, towards the end of that chapter, verse 43, and we read these verses that close that chapter out. So the Lord gave to Israel all the land of which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they took possession of it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest all around according to all that he had sworn to their fathers, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all the enemies into their hand. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. So we see this culmination of the promise. We see this culmination of the land being entered, the land divvied up, the tribes each receiving their inheritance. 
And these verses become very controversial. And there's tons written about them. And there's place, people that make all kinds of points about them. Because it makes it sound like it's all done. And yet we know already, if we've been paying attention, that there's places in the land where those that were to be eradicated have not been totally eradicated. They've still got servants amongst them in the Gibeonites that, that were supposed to be done away with, but still now just serve, the, the, serve Israel. We know that Jerusalem, which was within this land, is inhabited by the Gergesites all the way up until the time that David comes against, against that city and, and frees it. And so, not, so, so as much as this seems like it's all done and clean, it's not totally what's being said here. It's not to, what we're to conclude anyway. Because there were still tribes that were still within the land that needed to be dealt with and cities that would still be eventually taken. And Jerusalem was one of the, the last ones. And we come into chapter 22. Kind of an interesting, well, let's just let's read some and we'll talk. It says, Then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all I commanded you. You have not let your brethren these many days up to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. Now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren as he has promised them. Now therefore return and go to your tents to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Now remember, these are the tribes that decided they wanted to have the land on the east side. And they were promised that, but they were also told, you must fight with your brothers, and then you can return to that land. And we know that many of their soldiers stayed back. Many were sent into the battles. And now we need to realize the cost of that. This is some seven years later that they're finally going home. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Verse where they go, six. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now the half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan, but to the other half of it, Joshua gave a possession among their brethren on this side of the Jordan westward. And indeed, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and spoke to them, saying, Return with much riches to your tents, with very much livestock, with silver, with gold, with bronze, with iron, and with very much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. So the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh returned, and departed from the children of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the country of Gilead, to the land of their possession, which they had obtained according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So they're going home. They've been given riches to take back with them from the spoils of war, and they're doing to divide those so that everybody can share in that. <clears throat> and then for the remainder of this chapter, we have this really crazy scene, <clears throat> and how fast brothers can go from being peaceful to warlike with one another, and how fast an under misunderstanding could lead to that. Now, those of us that have siblings, we probably have experienced that at some point in our life, in our past how fast things can go sour with a sibling, especially when there's something misunderstood. And we're going to see here that they were bordering on warfare with their siblings, and they were at least went and listened to what was actually going on. We'll just read through this story, verse 10. And when they came to the region of the Jordan, this is those tribes returning to the east side, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, built an altar there by the Jordan, a great impressive altar. Now the children of Israel heard someone say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan, in the region of the Jordan, on the children of Israel's side. And when the children of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them. Just, just because they built an altar a big altar. They were going to go now and have war with their brothers. <clears throat> then the children of Israel sent Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, to the half-tribe of Manasseh, into the land of Gilead. And with him ten rulers, one ruler each from the chief house of every tribe of Israel, and each one was the head of the house of his father among the divisions of Israel. Then they came to the children of Reuben, to the children of Gad, to the half 
the tribe of Manasseh to the land of Gilead, and they spoke with them, saying, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What treachery is this that you have committed against the God of Israel, to turn away this day from following the Lord, and that you have built from yourselves an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord? So their opinion was they built this great altar there, away from Shiloh now, away from the tabernacle, away from the Ark of the Covenant. And their fear is, one, you're going to establish your own worship system. You're going to turn your back on what the Lord has given us. You're going to make sacrifices apart from what has been said. And then in that, we must probably surmise they're thinking about them going after other gods. And so they're panicked about what this may mean for them. Keep forgetting where I left off. Verse 17. Now they, they begin to remind their brothers of some of the really bad things that have happened in the past when worship was done in a way that shouldn't have been done towards something other than God. It is the iniquity of Peor not enough for us, from which we are not cleansed till this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord, and it shall be, if you rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. Nevertheless, if the land of your possession is unclean, then cross over to the land of the possession of the Lord, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take possession among us. But do not rebel against the Lord, nor rebel against us by building yourselves an altar besides the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on the congregation of Israel? And that man did not perish alone in his iniquity. Then the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said to the heads of the divisions of Israel, now they explain what they actually have done, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knows, and he let Israel itself know, if it is in rebellion or if in treachery against the Lord, do not save us this day. If we have built ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer on it a burnt offerings or grain offerings, or if to offer peace offerings on it, let the Lord himself require an account. But, in fact, we have done it for fear. For a reason, saying, in time to come, your descendants may speak to your descendants, saying, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? The Lord has made the Jordan a border between you and us. You children of Reuben and children of Gad, you have no part in the Lord. So your descendants would make our descendants cease fearing the Lord. So they were afraid that the separation of the Jordan River between the tribes of their brothers would someday to another generation cause them to second guess whether they had anything ever to do with the Lord their God. And so they built this, we're going to see, as a remembrance, as a memorial, so that their descendants would remember. Verse 26 Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build ourselves an altar, not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between you and us and our generations after us, that we may perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, and with our peace offerings, that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. Therefore we said that it will be when they say this to us, or to our generations in time to come, that we may say, here is the replica of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, though not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifices, but as a witness between you and us. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn from following the Lord this day, to build an altar for burnt offerings, for grain offerings, for sacrifices, besides the altar of the Lord our God, which is before his tabernacle. And when Phinehas the priest and the rulers of the congregation, the heads of the divisions of Israel who were with him, heard the words of the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the children of Manasseh spoke, it pleased them. Then Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest said to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the children of Manasseh, This day we perceive that the Lord is among us, because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest and the rulers returned from the children of Reuben and the children of Gad from the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan to the children of Israel and brought back word to them. So the thing pleased the children of Israel and the children of Israel blessed God. They spoke no more of going against them in battle to destroy the land where the children of Reuben and Gad dwelt. 
The children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar witness. For is a witness between us, the Lord is God. Happy ending. Wow, we moved through that quick. You get to go home early. Any thoughts or, or questions about that? I think it was pretty straightforward. Nice to see something work out for a change.